Catherine and I have been in churches, leading churches for the last 40 some years. And, uh, and no matter which church we go to, we have found this to be in common. That there is a misunderstanding between the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. There's a difference between the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. You see, the Bible's teaching on the fruit of the Spirit shows us that unlike the gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is not divided. So let me, let me clarify that. The gifts of the Spirit, you may have one or two of them, and that's what God intended. But the fruit of the Spirit is that we have every one of these in our lives. You remember what the fruits of the Spirit are? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's the package. So it would be like us saying, okay, I own a car. It just doesn't have an engine. But it's still a car, right? It'll go down the road, right? It'll do what it's supposed to. It'll go down. Oh, no tires. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. We, we, t- we talked several weeks about recipes. Do I need to read another recipe? You can't have chicken mwamba, which is a favorite of ours when we were serving as missionaries in Africa, without having mwamba. If you don't have mwamba, then you just have chicken. And it's not chicken mwamba. By the way, that's chicken with a peanut sauce. I like what uh, uh, Manafort uh, Gultz wrote in his book, The Fruit of the Spirit. It really, really does open my eyes. I hope it does the same for you. It says, he talks about the fruit of the Spirit and then compares it to light. Let me quote what he says. All the colors of the rainbow are in every beam of sunlight. It's there. They are all there at any one time. They may not be in our vision, but they're present. So it's not so important to think of a rainbow as the different colors that are being represented such is with the traits of personal conduct among believers with the fruit of the spirit so two weeks ago we talked about love right that's one of the things if we do not have love as god loves then we're not living in the fruit of the spirit it's not part of that recipe for what it means to be a Christian. Last week we looked at joy and how important it is for us to have joy in our lives. Not joy that the world has when you buy something new or, or when something works out, but rather true joy that is God given to us. And today I want to look at the Greek word irene which is translated peace. It's ironic, I believe, that, that, that we, we talk about peace while there's war everywhere around the world. Several dozen wars going on in other parts of the world. I mean, we expect it in the Middle East, we expect it in Ireland and former Yugoslavia. But what we don't understand that there are places on the earth that we're only vaguely aware and there's conflict that is there. I mean, they're on the, they're on the cusp of, of losing any sense of peace. 
places like India and Pakistan where there's ongoing hostility and warfare. In fact, if you go back in time, you'll find that the Bible records that there has hardly been since Adam and Eve a time when there has been complete peace in this world. And yet there's nothing that we really yearn for more than peace. The theologian William, William Barclay describes peace like this, the serenity and tranquility, that perfect contentment of life where we are completely happy and completely secure in God. So I started looking through the New Testament, and interestingly enough, there's 88 times that this word Irene, peace, is found in the New Testament. Not a surprise. What's a surprise to me is that this word Irene, peace, translated as priest, a peace, is found in every New Testament book. Since Jesus Christ came, was born, lived, died, and resurrected, from that moment on, we find peace being present in every situation in the New Testament. I, when I was a young pastor, just out of seminary, and, and, uh, and, and was, was pastoring in a, in a small church, There was an older saint, a parishioner in one of those churches, and and as we were talking, he said, Pastor, I think that I'd like you to have this, and and I'm like, well, well, thank you, that's that's kind of you. He handed me a slip of paper. It wasn't the $20 bill. But on this paper, it was, it, the edges were ragged, the, the, the ink had kind of faded, it had been folded up, and you could see the creases in the paper. He had carried this with him. He said to me, Pastor, I found this to help me when life gets rough. And I thought, oh, okay, these, maybe it's going to be a Bible verse or something, but this, these are the words he had written on this piece of paper. He wrote, peace and joy are twin blessings of the gospel. Did you catch that? We talked about joy last week. Peace and joy are twin blessings of the gospel. And then this is the description of it. Joy is peace dancing. I love that. And peace is joy resting. I love that definition. Joy is peace dancing, and peace is joy resting. It reminded me of that interconnectedness between those two in our lives. I mean, in my lifetime, although I've not been a participant in any military war, Catherine and I have lived war through the life and eyes of our middle son, Joshua, who was in the 82nd Airborne and a combat veteran of Afghanistan. We hear the story of how joy is snatched away, how peace cannot be found. In other ways, Catherine and I have experienced through our, our lives living through many wars, like the Cold War. Some of you will remember the Cold War. It was constantly a part of my childhood. The big one could come at any time. And then I remember the Vietnam War, that, that our nation was bogged down, unable to deliver itself from the entanglements and, and that sad conflict and the lack of peace that, that was there. Then came, came the war in Iraq in 91, and I remember as, as we sat there and watched on TV and all, and wondering what's happening to all these people, and and then Afghanistan for 20-some years trying to, to, I don't know what. And now Ukraine and Russia and who knows what will come next. And, and in the midst of all that, I, I began to understand that there's conflict in the world. 
but what we're lacking is peace. I remember in my younger years as many a young person of my age would stand up and would say out loud toward the government and toward other people, all we're wanting to say is please give peace a chance. And isn't that the yearning of our heart? Isn't that what we really desire? To be at peace and to have peace in our presence. So let me mention three biblical facts about this peace, that, that yearning for peace that's in our hearts. The first one is this, that authentic peace only comes from God. That's where it comes from. It doesn't come from anywhere else. Jesus is the one who gives us this this peace that passes all understanding, we say. Someone have your Bible with you? If you turn to John, the 14th chapter, and someone read verses 25 and 27 for us, please. If you haven't been bringing your Bibles, time to be bringing them. John, uh, John chapter 14, verses 25 through 27. Would someone be willing to read that, please? All right, I see up in the balcony, stand up and read. Let's go. John chapter 14, verses 25 to 27. Jesus says, yeah, that's, that's, that's great. Jesus says, listen, peace I'm going to leave with you. Where's it going? My peace I'm going to give to you. Where's it at? In fact, it's the Apostle Paul who writes to the young church in Ephesus. He said, for Jesus himself is our peace. And he's destroyed that barrier, the thing, the hostility that brings all this lack of peace in our lives. The law that we try to live up to so that we can have peace, it doesn't happen. He goes on to say, Jesus came and preached peace to you. And you who were far away, and and peace to those who were near as well. So the question for us this morning is, have you received this fruit of peace? Or are we trying to find our own peace? Remember, the last two weeks, we've said it very clear and openly. We can't produce these fruits on ourselves. We can try and try and try. They are gifts that God gives us. They must come from God. And yet, I can't tell you how many people come into my office, how many people I meet in the, as I'm out and about in town. They, they, they think that, that they can purchase their way into finding peace, if they just find that new home with, with that incredible ensuite, is that even, a, yeah, that's a word, isn't it? I, I heard it on HGTV. <laughs> or if you listen to, to the auto dealership, you can have this peace if you just have that new Audi. Or is it a Honda? Oh, it's sad. It's sad, but but there are some that even think that that they will find their perfect peace in life if they just find a new spouse, or if they just have that new baby, or or if they can just land that perfect job that there will be peace. Yes, there are some that think that if they just numb that restlessness of their soul through the use of alcohol and, and, and illegal drug abuse, that they will find that peace. And it's, I'm telling you, it's not there. I mean, we can go back to the 1500s or 1500 years ago to St. Augustine. Listen to what he says. Our hearts are restless. 
without peace. Till they find their rest or peace in God. If you remember your Bible verses that you've read from time to time, you'll recall that Jesus is, is called the Prince of Peace. He's the one that has come and destroyed all the things that, that we've bought into, saying that, that this is what will bring us peace. Because there's no peace that's comparable to the peace that comes from God's gift of his son, Jesus Christ. The second fact. The peace of God is different from what the world calls peace. We read earlier, uh, Pat read to us that, that Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. It's not as the world gives, so don't let your heart be troubled. And at the time that Jesus spoke those words, the classical Greek view of peace is identical to what our current culture's view of peace is. It's simply the, the absence of conflict. If you have no conflict, you have peace. That's our current world's view. And Jesus still urges you and me in the midst of the conflicts that are present in our world and in our own lives to be peacemakers. But here's where we often find ourselves. We, we claim if it's just the absence of conflict, so we don't speak the truth to people. We don't speak the truth to ourselves, and we say, listen, it, it's okay, you, you, because I'm going to be at peace. I, I don't want conflict in my life. And our faith becomes so watered down to where there is no conflict in our lives but there's conflict in our souls. You see, peace, if we look at it as simply the absence of conflict, is at best naive optimism. I encourage you to, to take a look at history. I, I'm a student of history. I would point you to Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain's pre-World War II policy that he put into place called the umbrella policy. Just take everybody in, no matter what they, whether they're on our side or not. Just take them in. Then we won't have conflict. But you see, the Bible's view of peace is totally different than that. It is the concept, the Old Testament concept of shalom. And it carries into the New Testament concept of, of the ideal of, of a state of life, a state of mind, of wholeness and wellness, that being in harmony with God and with each other. It embodies the totality of a life, not just segments of our lives. And that can only happen, my friends, when we are in a right relationship with God. That's it. It can't happen any other way. If you think that we can get peace through other means, it simply means that, that we are watering it down and that we all know what watered down lemonade tastes like. The biblical concept of peace admits that there is sin in the world, even sin in our own lives. It admits to the fact that we need Jesus Christ and to receive Jesus Christ into our lives. That we need to go beyond that. It means that we begin to develop that relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, when we define peace in that way, Peace is tied to our salvation. That's when we find true peace. 
We've talked about this with, with love and joy. It's tied to our salvation as well. It's an ongoing theme that I had missed for how many decades in my pastoral ministry. That these fruits of the Spirit are tied to our salvation through Jesus Christ. And it's the true writing of those relationships with God and with each other that counts. I like what Alan Richardson, a biblical scholar, writes. He says, it is after the resurrection, the Lord greets his disciples with peace. And he shows them the marks of passion. And then he passes the peace on to them. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the gospel of peace for us and for all of humanity. The third fact. That this peace which Jesus promises us passes all of our human understanding. I don't understand how it works, my friends. We read this verse in the last two weeks when Paul wrote it to the, to the young church at Philippi. He said, I, I, I want to tell you, you should rejoice, be happy, be filled with joy. I'll say it again, he says. I believe you need to be filled with joy. Let your gentleness, do not be anxious and everything. Pray. Be thankful. Present your request to God. And then the peace of God which passes, transcends all understanding will guard your hearts. You know when Paul wrote that to the church in Philippi? He was writing from prison in Caesarea. He experienced peace that passed everything that he possibly thought that he could experience because of his relationship with God. You see, peace can be lacking even in the midst of, of, of tranquility in our lives. I've seen it so often. Those on the opposite side, those who have everything, find themselves restless with no peace. And interestingly enough, peace can be present even if there's conflict in our hearts, crisis, as Paul writes. I would only point us back to the, the history that shows us that the martyrs had this great peace inside of them because they had this relationship with Jesus Christ that, that transcended everything. I like what uh, Paul wrote because he said, this will guard your hearts and minds. The Greek word that's used there is, is like it's, it's a, a platoon, a troop, that will surround your, your life. It'll surround your heart. It, it'll set up a guard post, set up guard duty to protect the peace and the joy that would enable us to to accomplish our mission of living for Christ. When this happens, it means that there will be a release from anxiety. That's where the peace comes. Don't worry about anything. Your father knows exactly what you need. And your father knows exactly when you need it. Therefore, don't worry. Therefore, be at peace. But peace only comes by trust. So all I want to ask this morning is this. Are, are, are we willing, and let me make it personal, because I ask myself the personal questions. I don't ask for myself and Catherine. Are you willing to give peace a chance. No matter what's going on in life, are you willing to give peace a chance? The peace of God, not the worldly peace, the peace of God. I, I don't know any better story to, to conclude the message than a story that no doubt you've heard, but it's worth retelling Autumn of 1873, 
a wealthy Chicago businessman, placed his wife, Anna, and her four children on a ship sailing from New York to France. He was forced to stay behind. Guess what? He had some business to take care of. He'd followed them later on. The evening of November 21, as they were proceeding toward France, a few hours later, about 2 o'clock in the morning, the engine stopped, the ship stood still, passages were filled with terrified people. It had rammed an English vessel. Mrs. Spafford and, and the three children were swept away at sea, even as she was clinging, holding on to her youngest The news made it back via a cable from his wife who was rescued unconscious by some sailors. He was crushed with the news, walked the floor in anguish, and toward the morning he turned to a friend and listened to the words he said. He had peace. He said, and I quote, I'm glad to trust in the Lord when it will, I am glad to trust the Lord when it costs me something. We often take the opposite. On the way across the Atlantic to join his wife, the captain announced the place where he had lost his children. They paused for a moment in honor of those who had lost their lives. He didn't stand outside and watch, but rather he went to his cabin and he wrote the hymn, It is well with my soul. In the agony of loss, when his suffering was the greatest, when he could have had a great deal of conflict and could have thrown everything in God's face. He had that relationship with God and with Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior that he was able to express the peace which passes all understanding. So I say it this morning. Out of love for you, if you have not received this Jesus Christ who can bring, bring peace into your troubled life, why not give it a chance? Why not do it now? Why not do it now? Maybe you have received Jesus Christ, but you've pushed this fruit out and you've let the world replace it with a false peace. You allow, and, and you can tell this happens if, if that's what's happened. You can tell it with these real simple things. Do you get frustrated with things? Do you start worrying about things? Do you, you try to jump in and take charge of things when they seem to be going south? If that's the case, my friends, take the peace that you think you have, which is the, what the world has tried to sell you, and exchange it for the real peace. The real peace that comes only from God. When peace like a river attendeth my way. When peace like a river. Let it flow, my friends. Let it flow. Most holy God, may this fruit of your spirit.
peace be ours as we open ourselves to the faithfulness of your Holy Spirit. 